Everyone, welcome to this incredibly exciting seminar uh, webinar with a Maghreb Institute and Yakin Institute partnering up together. Uh, the title today is A Map to Calm. Inshallah, we'll be joined very shortly with all of our instructors. But in the meantime, I just want to make sure that everyone can hear us and see us clearly. So please do let me know if you can see me, if you can hear me, and everything looks and sounds okay before we kick off for today's session. Jazakallah khair to those who are already jumping. Yes, some and you were first, mashallah, in the chat on YouTube. Congratulations. Um, and I see, mashallah, now dozens and dozens more of you have joined us. So welcome from the Yakin Institute family and the Al Institute family to today's webinar. We're incredibly excited to kick off. I know this is, uh, subhanAllah, something that's super, super relevant right now. Mental health is getting a good amount of attention within the Muslim community, but we are not nearly where we need to be. And we're very excited at Al Institute and Yakin Institute uh, to be able to present not only this topic today, this much needed topic on attaining calmness, on peace and tackling some of the difficult things that Muslims struggle with um, in the modern world, but also to present an exciting experience. Alhamdulillah, Al Maghrib Institute has not just been raising awareness for mental health, uh, you know, mental health in the Muslim community, but we've also been, uh, you know, working very, very hard on a complete online experience, an in-depth course that tackles a myriad of issues when it comes to Muslim mental health, from the taboo topics to the intense topics that are, uh, you know, niche in the community to the everyday struggles to maintain a healthy uh, mental state. So Alhamdulillah, that, that course has been available for a little bit. A lot of you have been benefiting and enjoying it, but it's closing very soon. It's actually closing tomorrow. So please do make sure that throughout this webinar, as you're benefiting, you're sharing it about it, inshallah, in your groups, you're you're tagging people in the chats uh, and you're sharing the khair inshallah, but you're also registering for the course at online because it is pay what you can. It's accessible across the globe, inshallah, to everyone. Um, so without further ado, I do want to jump into the session because there's some really exciting topics that we're tackling today. Uh, and it's super exciting because all of our speakers today are actually our instructors in the Inside Out, Outside In course by Al Maghrib Institute. Uh, the speakers today are Sheikh Omar Hussein, Sister Sara Sultan, and Sheikh Omar Suleiman, Alhamdulillah, the Yaqeen family and the Al Maghrib family coming together uh, for today's topic. And we're going to be starting off in just a couple of minutes with Sheikh Omar Hussein. I see a lot of people coming in, mashallah, from different parts of the world. Jazakul Khair to those of you who are flags in the chat. Let us know where you're coming in from. Um, if you've attended any of the other mental health webinars that we've had previously, and if you benefited uh, any anything that you shared, alhamdulillah, please do uh, drop that into the chat. I see, mashallah, thousands of, or not thousands, you know, dozens of comments, mashallah, coming in. Ling coming in from the Philippines, mashallah, lovely to see that. Um, coming from Balochistan, Malaysia. From Belgium, mashallah. Some of you staying up very, very late for this series. New Jersey, mashallah. London. Where else are you coming from? Salam from Calgary. Let us know your city as well. Uh, Jazakallah khair, those who mentioned your city. Malaysia, Mexico City, North Carolina. Fatma's coming in from. Let's see some of these on the screen, actually. That would be awesome. Um, Dia is coming in from Taiwan. Jill is coming in from Rhode Island. Uh, Maliha is coming in from California. MA is coming in from London. Keep dropping those into the chat. Um, it's beautiful to see this international community. And alhamdulillah to see all of our friends from Yakin Institute and Al Maghrib Institute coming together uh, for today webinar. Alhamdulillah. Aish coming in from Canada. Musarat coming in from Bangladesh. Let's see some more brothers. Uh, if you're a brother watching this, please tag another brother, inshallah, into the chat. Uh, make sure that uh, you have everyone benefiting. There's actually a, a good amount of content that's focused on brothers today. And the first topic that we are going to be tackling with Sheikh Omar Hussein is going to be um, on the topic of uh, walking back from the ledge, men and suicide. So we're not hiding back from any of the difficult conversations today. And I'm very excited to uh, introduce you guys, inshallah, to our first instructor as well. Uh, Sheikh Omar Hussein is the head of instruction at Yakin's Institute and the Expanded Learning Team. He's also one of our newest instructors at Al Maghrib Institute, and he's graduated from Al -Azhar, Azhar University with a degree in Islamic Studies and Arabic. He's a licensed professional counselor, a licensed chemical dependency counselor, and he has a PhD in counselor education and supervision in the University of Texas in San Antonio. His knowledge of the Islamic and social sciences makes him uniquely equipped to address contemporary and issues facing the Muslim community. So we're very excited to have him be uh, a part of this course to be teaching us and instructing us as part of Inside Out, Outside In, and alhamdulillah to have him with us today. So I'm going to bring him on screen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Sheikh Omar. How are you doing today? Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Good alhamdulillah. Good to hear. To hear. Uh, it's, the audio is a little bit low, Sheikh Omar. Uh, I don't know if I'll let everyone else also pipe in to the chat before we jump into the session because we don't want to miss any of this content, inshallah. Uh, I, I just might be shouting. That could be also that. <laughs> how, how about now? Is it better now? Still a Pat on the lower side. You guys let us as well. I know there's a bit of a let until the audio is going to reach you. So let us know when you do hear, um, if you can hear the shift clearly, if there's any issues with the audio. 
Um, and if there's a possible possibility to switch a device, that'd be awesome, Sheikh. Otherwise, we'll see if we can um, kick off the session, inshallah. Okay, let's do another test. Testing with, uh, for with a little sentence, inshallah. Bismillah. Is this, can you hear me now? Still a little low. Okay, so someone's, everyone else is saying, okay, no, there, there, some people are saying it is low. A couple people are saying that they can hear good. Um, do you have an external uh, audio device by any, t by any chance, Sheikh? I don't. Maybe it's just my 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 volume. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Enough people are saying it's 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 clear. Some people are saying mine is a bit loud, so it might be just be the contrast between the two of ours, inshallah. So Bismillah. It sounds like everyone is is okay with the audio. That's good to hear. Let us start off the session. It's a tough. It's a difficult topic, and I know Sheikh, you cover as well. Um, you know, a couple of lessons as well when it comes to myths about mental health from the male perspective and the course inside out. So we're excited to hear your uh, you know insight, inshallah, on this difficult issue, and we'll jump straight into it. Bismillah, Sheikh. I'll pass it to you. Jazakallah khairan, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulihi al-kareem. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasli amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. So alhamdulillah, I'm, uh, I'm seeing a lot of I can hear you loud and clear and everything is clear. So inshallah everything is, is good. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a topic which, you know, takes some courage to approach. And that is men and suicide. Now, in the Inside Out course, I talk about some, some mental health myths regarding men. Um, but this is uh, something very serious, which is even, you know, takes it to another level. So let me, let me start with some statistics. According to the CDC, see, uh, suicide, <clears throat> excuse me, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States which when you think about it is pretty remarkable because that means, uh, you know, you have cancer above it, you have heart disease, but it's like, how many things could there really be that suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States? Men are three and a half times more likely than women to commit suicide. Now let's, before we get further, let's also, you know, it's important to kind of look in detail as these stats. 70% of the men that are committing suicide are white males. However, given how prevalent suicide is being the 10th leading cause, that still leaves 30% of non-white men who are committing suicide. And that is incredibly troubling. And we have to ask ourselves why. The Muslim community is no exception. Um, when I look back, this was seven years ago, you know, when we were uh, young and excited to serve our communities. And I remember a friend of mine speaking uh, about a masjid that I attended growing up. <clears throat> he said this year we had 15 suicides, 15 janazas, which were related to suicides. And as I think back on it, at that time, I remember, you know, like, my mom would say, there's a janazah today, let's go. And you say, oh, it was so-and-so's son, what happened? I said, oh, I don't know, he was traveling or, you know, there was some accident. Like, it, it, there was never a clear explanation. It always seemed uh, very bizarre, the, the sorts of explanations, very unclear. And now, after this time and seeing what's happening, now I, I see exactly what it was. It was indeed suicides. Now, the only reason I know that that masjid in that year had 15 suicides is because I knew those who worked internally uh, in the religious sector there. The family did everything to hide the suicides. As a matter of fact, some of them would hold extravagant sort of khatam al-Qur'ans, you know, completions of the Qur'an, or sort of these like, grave things to really go overboard to remember um, about, to remember their, uh, their, their, their loved one that passed. But those were suicides that were, that were taking place. And uh, that is, you know, we're, we're trying to get ahead and we're trying to limit these things in the first place. Now, before I go any further, let me make one point very clear. Uh, Islamically speaking, suicide is forbidden, okay? And I think 
everyone listening to this knows that. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا Do not kill yourselves, meaning in fighting, and then also do not, uh, don't fight each other, don't kill each other, and then don't kill yourselves, meaning uh, the, the suicide. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسَهُ بِشَيْءٍ عُذِّبَ بِهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Whoever kills themselves kills himself, uh, with a thing, um, you know, whether it's, it's a gun or whatever, they will be punished by that thing on the Day of Judgment. So why am I mentioning that if we all know the ruling? It's very important. Listen to this point very importantly. Religious beliefs are a protective factor from suicide. When we deal with clients who mention that they have suicidal ideation, we create with them what we call a safety plan. And in the safety plan, we go through, you know, when you feel like doing it, what are some areas of support that you have? Um, what are some tools that you have? And what we see, whether it's Muslim or non-Muslim clients, they will say, I've thought about it, I've considered it, but I would never go through with it. And the reason why I would never go through with it is because it's against my religious beliefs, you see. So if we're talking about preventing suicide, it's important that people know that just understanding the Islamic ruling on suicide is going to be enough to prevent many people from going through with it. Now, that being said, the reality is if somebody is having suicidal thoughts or somebody actually commits the act, what does that actually mean? Well, something uh, to think about it, when it when it comes to um, when it comes to those going through with it is that we don't need to tell them, it's haram to commit suicide when someone is having those ideations. It's like the person who comes who's addicted to alcohol. They don't need a lecture on how alcohol is haram. They already know that. They already know that. We don't need to beat them over the head. The same thing with, with suicide. If someone has these feelings, they know it's haram, but sometimes people get in such a dark place that it's difficult for them to pull themselves out of it. And so that's why it's important for us to kind of step in there and prevent it. So why are men so much more likely to commit suicide? So we know that <clears throat> women may attempt more, but men will, uh, you know, actually go through and, and, and complete the suicide more. Well, uh, when we look across cultures, we have, of course, these traditional male gender roles. And most of those discourage really any form of expression, any, any form of struggle. It's always this kind of like, just, um, just be strong, you know, um, don't be a wimp, right? That's all fine and good. I'm not talking about that somebody faces a little diversity or a little adversity and they're not and they just fall apart. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the things that some men go through. It is impossible to ask any human being to just deal with it without offering support. I'll give you an example. We see, and I'm not talking about whose fault it was or whatever, divorce. Okay. You have a man, you have a father who loves his children, who has spent and dedicated years of his life, of his life to his children. And what happens now? The marriage ends in a divorce. And now the men have to live with the fact that they don't get to see their kids every day. The kids that they helped raise, the kids that they invested their time with, they get to see them on the weekends or every other week. Could you imagine how difficult that is to tell somebody who's dedicated their life to their family that you can only see them now every couple of weeks? How can any human being just, how can you just say, deal with that? I think that's 
the, the person saying that I think is heartless. That's not about, oh, just get tough and get over it. What are you talking about? These are relationships they're going to have with their children for the rest of their lives. How can someone get through? That is an incredibly difficult position to be in. But many times we will say traditionally, for whatever reason, just get over it. That's difficult. We also know that depression is, is, is probably underdiagnosed in men. And when you speak to people who've gone through real depression, then you know the seriousness of it. I'm not talking about, oh, I'm depressed because, you know, uh, the Maple Leafs didn't win again. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about serious, just uh, th there are symptoms of clinical depression. Okay. And that oftentimes is underdiagnosed. Now, we know that Islam tells the man that they are to be the provider, right? Now, imagine now you have a job loss and you can't care for your family. What is that going to do? That's not something, oh, just tough it out and just apply and get another job tomorrow. It takes time to get a job. It takes time to uh, find work. It is not that simple. How can any anyone with any ounce of compassion just tell this person, just kind of move on? with What are they going through? I, I can never forget seeing a picture of uh, a father, Palestinian father, just standing there holding his child, his home was demolished in front of him. And it, it the look, I, I can't even describe. It's like, what am I supposed to do now? What is my role? It's just all been taken from me. I have nothing I can provide. What, what, a, what a, a helpless feeling to have. And that is going to have some serious, serious uh, psychological detrimental psychological effects going on in that situation. So why don't we reframe it a little bit and look at, look, we're not saying day-to-day -day things. We're, we're talking about serious things. This is what's pushing men to ultimately take their life. We also know that men are less likely to seek help, seek help for emotional problems. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Who is suffering in that case? It's not just the men. It's everyone around. It's the men. It's the families involved. It's, it's the friends. Everyone around. So if we keep having this stigma for men to seek help, then that's going to continue to happen. Because you know what men do? They won't seek help for emotional issues, but they will try to self-treat themselves. They will start drinking. They will start smoking. They will start trying drugs and different things. And it numbs the pain. It, it just makes everything go away. They don't have to be in that place. As I've, over the years, worked with a lot of uh, individuals in drug, in, um, in, in drug rehabilitation, I've developed incredible empathy for people. Like, I think... The way many of us are raised is like, oh, those are losers. They have no future. How could they do that? Such a simplistic black and white way of looking at things. You and I don't know the things that people are going through. And men will just internalize that, internalize that because they're told you're not supposed to seek help. You're not supposed to do anything. And they will, you know, suffer in silence. And so what happens? We have another, uh, another case of, a man takes his life in the community. Oh, I, I can't believe it. The brother was always here at the masjid. I can't believe it. He was this and he was that. All of that happens. So it's a very sad thing because we're saying it's not okay for you to get help. It's not okay uh, for you to, uh, to go to anyone to help in the challenges that you're having. And what a shame that is. And what a responsibility we indeed have for that. So... Let me conclude by what if you are struggling, okay? What if you're struggling? Well, the first thing that all of us we can do as a community is raising awareness. That's what we're doing here right now, um, which again is a big step forward. And I, I'm very grateful and feel very blessed to be able to be part of a collaboration where we're not just acting like this doesn't exist. But beyond that, well, something to consider is a support group. 
just a simple support group. You don't you don't have to have a professional. Just uh, look, life's tough right now. I'm going through this. Okay, um, something something that you can start in your community. For example, uh, support group for divorced fathers. Support support group for divorced fathers with kids. Support group for the uh, unemployed. For those who are unemployed, right? And you can you can form networks and 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 it's just that group support can be so huge to help lift people out of being in 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 such depth and and so deep in, in darkness. Now beyond that, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, you know what, I do know some people. This you know this this guy was he was very. Um, you know, very outgoing, very social, and just kind of disappeared, or I haven't heard from him, and just kind of he spends a lot of time in his room, and we don't know what's going on. We, we, we probably know someone like that. So what do we do in that case? Well, ask the person if they are actually thinking about suicide. Contrary to popular belief, if you ask someone if they're thinking about suicide, it doesn't mean they're going to commit suicide, especially if they've mentioned it. Now, don't just ask someone um, if there's, if you don't see it, but when you're seeing serious things that are of concern, you know, they're not, uh, going to class anymore. They're not, um, you know, they, they just abruptly all of a sudden quit their job or something like that. Then ask them, particularly if they've hinted at it or spoken about it or mentioned something about it. Uh, secondly, just listen, we're not telling you to be a professional counsel, but just listen, um, and don't minimize their concerns. It may seem ridiculous that they would consider something like suicide, but just listen so that they uh, minimize and share your concerns. Look, I, I, I'm, I care about you. That's why I'm, I'm asking you. If, you. if you are also really seeing this as a, as a regular pattern, encourage them to seek professional help. There are suicide hotlines um, for, for those difficult moments, but encourage them really to seek help um, so that they can get the help that they need. Um, it, some practical things also, in addition to this, is if they have access to firearms to actually try to remove those firearms uh, or any other means that they might might be in their possession. And then check in with them regularly. Just a simple text M might be all it takes, right? Make sure, hey, just, just check in, just hoping everything is okay. Okay. Remember this, that suicide is absolutely preventable. It is something that you and I, and as a community, we can prevent. It is there in the Muslim community. It is real. It is happening. And there's no reason why we need to sit by silently and allow it to, um, to occur. So inshallah, we try to do our part. And, um, you know, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to really help those brothers who feel that they are struggling and are just uh, you know, in a, in a dark place where they don't feel that they can, ha where they don't have any help. We say, inshallah, there are people out there who care about you, who do want to help you, and who do um, want to uh, want to assist in this in the uh, the Inside Out course. We do, uh, I do talk about some mental health mental health myths for men, which I think is uh, important. It puts things into perspective that really shows that um, as men we need connection we need emotional connection and we do that in other ways but it's just like for some reason when it comes to seeking help or professional counseling um that somehow we're hesitant on it. so i kind of call some of those things out um so inshallah that will be a benefit jazakumallah khairan wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh Hussain, for tackling that difficult topic as we kick off our Map to Comp webinar. Um, as the Sheikh did mention, I think that is one of the things that we want to focus on, as I was mentioning earlier, that there is an improvement in mental health awareness within the Muslim community, but within men, it still lacks. There's still a, a huge, I think, gap and chasm that we have to cross right now. And this is one effort, inshallah, to be inclusive in the courses is, is, is applicable, open to both men and women, but we do tackle some specific issues that men uh, encounter and as well uh, some, some differences in terms of men and women handling boundaries and things like that. So I do encourage you guys to check out. There's a, so many topics that are covered in Inside Out and Sheikh Hussein teaches uh, a complete module with uh, you know over a dozen lessons, mashallah. 
uh, tackling that as well. So just like for being with us, Uh We're excited to inshallah pepper you with questions in the class. I know you've already had one Q&A session with the internal students. That was an easy one. Uh, because people were just warming up. So inshallah, we're excited to have inshallah a lot of male students again join us for the rest of the experience and to ask their deep-rooted questions on uh, Muslim mental health. Inshallah, we will catch you inside the course. For now, Jazakallah for joining us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Awesome sauce. And that was our first session with Sheikh Omar Hussein, who is one of your instructors for um, our Inside Out course with Al Maghrib Institute. Once again, Inside Out is the course that is making this experience possible. And it's the culmination of all the efforts that Al Maghrib has been putting together for a, a long time, well over a year now, to present you all with a complete course on Muslim mental health, Islamic solutions for mental, physical, and spiritual spiritual well-being. So we brought on, alhamdulillah, Sheikh Omar Hussein, our instructor, Sister Sar Sultan as well, who is an, a huge contributor with Al Maghrib Institute and a fellow at Yakin Institute, and then Sheikh Omar Suleiman as well to add in the Tazkia aspect. I highly encourage you guys, if you're benefiting, if you're watching this, this uh, live stream and this webinar right now, head over to online. It's a pay what you can experience, so it's accessible to everybody worldwide. And we're only going to be able to tackle a few questions or a few uh, you know, important essential topics today, but the course is a whole new uh, world of, of, of topics that we're covering around Muslim mental health. And alhamdulillah, it's such a pleasure to have the contribution of professionals, Muslim mental health professionals, to make it uh, scientifically accurate and as well as informed by the deen, alhamdulillah. So the next session that we are going to be having uh, that I'm very excited to announce is with Sister Sara Sultan, who is our second instructor for the Inside Out course, uh, who is also a fellow at Yakin Institute. She's going to be covering the topic of just breathe, managing emotional reactions. I love the modules that I've been, uh, or the lessons I've been watching in Sister Sara Sultan's module in the Inside Out course. But for those who may not be familiar or who are new to her work, Sister Sara Sultan is a licensed professional counselor and a licensed mental health counselor who strives to empower her clients through achieving healthier more fulfilling lives and relationships while reconnecting with Allah through the healing process. Sarah has obtained a ma master's degree in mental health counseling and she's practiced therapy for over 10 years, mashallah. And we're super excited to have her with us for today's webinar as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Sister Sarah Sultan. How are you doing today? Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm doing well. Alhamdulillah. How are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm really well. I actually was a little stressed about this webinar a little earlier today. So I kid you not, I was listening to your lessons in the Inside Out course because I think this listening calms me down. Alhamdulillah, emotional regulation. I'll tell you the name of the lesson later. But Jazakallah khair uh, for being with us today. Wa iyakum, wa iyakum. I'm glad it could help. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Very, very full circle today. Alhamdulillah. So we're excited to ta tackle this topic. I know you, you go in a lot more depth about um, you know practical mental health skills in the Inside Out course, but this inshallah is going to be a great start for people to tackle this specific uh, issue of when they're having big emotional reactions, intense emotional reactions, how do they respond to that? So let's jump right into it. Bismillah, I'm going to pass the stage to you. Jazakumullah khairan for the opportunity to join all of you today to speak with all of you about this topic. Um, I think, you know, the reason why I wanted to speak about this topic of managing big emotions is because I think that all of us have this experience of having a struggle when different triggers hit us, right? Whether it's, you know, somebody says something offensive or whether, you know, your child just knows how to push your buttons in just the right way or you get into an argument with your spouse and it escalates very quickly. These big emotional reactions are a part of our daily life. And a lot of times it can result in a lot of feelings of guilt and shame when you feel like you lose control over your emotions in those moments. And so I wanted to talk about this to number one, normalize the fact that this happens to us all, including therapists, right? And number two, to realize that there is a lot of room for change, alhamdulillah. Like there are a lot of practical methods that we can use, both from a psychological perspective and from a spiritual Islamic perspective to be able to create this change, inshallah. These patterns don't have to ha uh, take over our lives for the rest of time. We have the power to change them. So to just start off, the first thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is to understand what emotions are. And the simple definition that I usually use is that emotions are signals within our bodies that tell us what's happening. It tells us that, hey, this is something that you need to pay attention to. It's a signal to pay attention that something matters to you in this situation because you're not going to have an emotional reaction to something that doesn't matter. So this is something important. 
and emotions and big emotions are so frequent that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned it in so many ahadith because they're such a natural part of life. Where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi for example, described anger as a burning coal and that it burns in the heart, which is such an apt description of that emotion. And he used to make dua to seek refuge in Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala from grief and sadness. That he knew that these emotions are very impactful. These are big emotions that can really, uh, that can really play a role in our lives. So he made dua uh, seeking refuge from them. So when we're talking about emotions, one of the things to realize is we can't control our circumstances or even our immediate emotional reaction, right? What we feel immediately in a circumstance, in a situation, that is not so controllable. But what we can control is how we react to them. So the Prophet Muhammad was asked, tell me about a deed that will admit me into paradise. And the Prophet Muhammad responded, do not be angry and you will enter paradise. So he's naming one of these big emotions, anger. And he's saying, do not get angry, like do not respond in anger and you will enter paradise, inshallah, right? So controlling our response to anger and other big emotions is really difficult. And we see that if, if the reward for controlling it is Jannah, then we know that it's a big deal and it's not going to be an easy path. It's going to be hard, but it's worth it and it's not impossible. If it was impossible, then it wouldn't have been fair for us to have this incredible reward attached to it and then for it to be unattainable. So for a reward like this to be attached to controlling our anger, that means that controlling our anger is attainable or controlling any emotional response is attainable, right? And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us also in the, in the Quran, and I love this, this ayah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is praising certain attributes. He says, those who spend in Allah's cause, in prosperity and adversity, those who repress their anger and those who pardon men, verily Allah loves the good doers. So these are all people who are labeled under the label of, of good doers. And one of those are those who repress their anger. Those who repress these big emotional reactions where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not saying don't feel anger. He didn't say those who do not feel anger. He says those who repress their anger, meaning that they don't react in anger, that there's a circumstance that arises that yields the feeling, but the reaction is not in anger. And that's a very powerful distinction. And we need to pay attention to that. There's nothing Islamically that tells us we're not allowed to feel. Right? We, there's so many ahadith that talk about big emotions that are felt by the most righteous of people. We know Prophet Yaqub, for example, cried until his, his eyes became white with grief. That's how big the emotion was. Right? And so there are a lot of big emotions and there's nothing wrong with the emotion as long as we act appropriately. And that's what we're held accountable for, our actions. So now how the how. Right. And in the course, you know, in my module, one of the things I wanted to make sure to emphasize is the practical nature of Islamic psychology, of this intertwining of our faith and our mental wellness. And so I wanted to go a little bit into the how of how to manage big emotions. So working on how we respond to our emotions is incredibly powerful. It can be really transformative. It can be transformative for our mental health, and it can be transformative for our relationships with people that we care about, um, the way that we see ourselves, and then also primarily in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we can change these patterns, so many things in our lives can change. So when there's a big emotional reaction, what happens neurologically in our brains is that we go into survival mode. So when something happens, for example, your child is tantruming or you've gotten into an argument with your spouse and you notice this buildup of big emotions, this buildup of anger and frustration coming up in your system, your brain registers this as danger. Your brain then goes into survival mode saying, hey, like fight, flight or freeze response. You need to figure out how you're going to respond. We need to get to safety. And when this happens, when we're going into survival mode, it shuts down the part of the brain that's responsible for making good decisions. It prevents us from being able to think clearly. And that's why in these types of situations, we can tend to react in unhealthy ways or do things during times of difficulty that we wouldn't have done during times of ease.
you might sometimes feel like you're one person during your regular life and then all of a sudden this monster version of you comes out in these types of situations and you're just you're like where did that come from right and what you don't realize is that it comes from your brain telling you this is dangerous you need to respond as though it's dangerous even though it's not and so one of the ways to be able to deal with big emotions is to tell your brain that you're safe how do we do that so i use a threefold method and these are physical spiritual and mental so a physical shift is the first step and the reason why this is the first step is because once your body feels safe your brain can register safety and we see this in the quran right where where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comforts the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was going through a really difficult time he comforts him by saying we know how your heart is distressed at what they say but celebrate the praises of your Lord and be of those who prostrate themselves in adoration. So what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encouraging here? First, he's validating that the Prophet sallallahu is feeling a sense of distress, that he's feeling a difficult emotion, that he's feeling this discomfort. And then he is encouraged to praise your Lord, right? So using, you know, using this verbal, this verbal cue, but then also prostrate yourself in adoration using action allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is prescribing action to alleviate the anxiety that the prophet sallallahu is experiencing at this time and so when we use a physical shift it helps to alleviate the 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 difficult emotions that we're struggling with so um when we are trying to relax our bodies in order to turn off survival mode that's going off in our brains one thing to realize is you need to give yourself at least 90 seconds. 90 seconds is a magical number in, in this situation because all of those chemicals going through your, your body and your brain that are yielding this big reaction, it takes 90 sec seconds for them to cycle, to cycle out. So if you can literally pause and look at your watch and time yourself for 90 seconds, you will be much calmer by the end of it. And that pause is incredibly powerful, where you pause and you breathe and you you pause and you realize that that moment that you're triggered, right? By something somebody says, by something somebody does, by a bad news that you receive, that trigger and your response, the more you can create distance between point A and point B, the better you're going to be able to react, the larger your window of opportunity. When you can expand that space, it's incredibly powerful. So some ways to be able to expand that space is, like I said, look at your watch, breathe. Deep breathing is very helpful. Tensing and releasing parts of your body to relax your body. So, you know, you might tense your, your hands and count to five and then relax them. You might tense your shoulders and count to five and then relax them, right? So tensing and releasing parts of your body. Um, drinking something cool can also really help. Changing your posture. The Prophet Muhammad says that when one of you becomes angry while standing, he should sit down. If the anger leaves him, good. Otherwise, he should lie down. So this changing of posture creates that pause. And also, if you are unsafe and you're standing, are you going to sit if you're in an unsafe situation? No. If you are sitting and it's an unsafe situation, are you going to lie down? Absolutely not. And so this technique of the Prophet Sallallahu is a way to tell your mind that I'm okay. This is not a dangerous situation. This is fine. And it really teaches your body and your brain that you're okay. Making wudu as well. The Prophet Sallallahu encouraged this, that he says, when one of you gets angry, perform wudu because anger arises from fire. So if you use cool water and you focus on it, and this is actually a technique. So this it's called grounding where you you wash your hands and as you feel the water as you're making wudu you focus on the feeling of the water between your fingers and through your hands and on your arms and on your face that helps your brain to register a sense of safety and you can also do this that kind of grounding um you know if if it's not possible for you to make wudu in that moment you can do it in in so many different ways you can pay attention to the what you see around you with your eyes what you hear around you with your ears you can pay attention to the taste of a a, a glass of something that you're drinking right you can use your senses you can feel a ring on your finger you can you can register the feeling of it so you can use your senses so that's the physical shift now 
The second step is the spiritual shift. And a spiritual shift is incredibly powerful because when we're feeling emotionally overwhelmed, if we can use that moment of difficulty to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that test suddenly brings us closer to him and it can be really transformative. So one of the ways that I think is very powerful is if we transform an uncomfortable emotion into a du'a. And we see the prophets, you know, have done this. Like, for example, Nuh he, he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, I, I feel so defeated, so help me. Right? He, he is acknowledging the feeling and then he's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help him. So, for example, if you're, you know, if, if you're in a situation that, um, you know, your, your child, your, your child is tantruming and you tell it, you say, yeah, Allah, I'm so overwhelmed right now. I just don't know what to do. It almost feels like I can't control myself. Please help me through this. And then you reaffirm, you are the source of support and comfort. Please give me what I need in order to manage this. You can also in for the spiritual shift, you can also choose an ayah or dot to help you when you are experiencing a strong emotion. And it's good to have one picked, one that really resonates with you. Like the Prophet ﷺ encourages, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, right? Where you're seeking refuge from Shaitan because Shaitan is one of the reasons why our anger is coming up so strongly. He he preys on our vulnerabilities. Um, something like Hasbi Allahu la ilaha illa huwa alayhi tawakkaltu wa huwa Rabbul Arsh al is one of my personal favorites, where I'm reminding myself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sufficient for me. There's no one worthy of worship except him. And I've placed my trust in him, right? So in those, in those moments, or la hawla wa la quwata illa billah, there's no might or power except Allah, or Allahu Akbar, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater. He's greater than everything. He's greater than whatever struggle you're going through. He's greater than anything that this person might be doing or saying, right? And then finally, from the spiritual perspective, is this idea of submission. If in that moment, after calming your body, you can remind yourself to submit, right? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, whoever submits their whole self to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is the doer of good, they will get reward. And on them, there shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. So we see that submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an antidote to big emotions. And there's even a technique um, in, in therapy. It's called willing hands, right? So you see my hands. I'm making sure in my camera that you can see it. Like this is the position of willing hands. And it looks just like the position of baking diet. And in this technique, so you would rest your, you know, you can do it like this or you can rest your hands on your lap or on something. It is very hard to be angry when your hands are open like this in this way. And so this is why it's a technique for, for um, emotional regulation in therapy. And I thought it was so profound because it's the same thing as, you know, like as, as making, uh, making du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And the Rasul even talks about this, where he says that when, when we raise our hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this way and make du'a, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too kind to allow us to bring them back empty. SubhanAllah. And then finally for the mental shift. And the reason why I'm leaving this for last is because a mental shift is not always helpful when our emotions are too big. So when the intensity of our emotions is huge, we can't think rationally. And so creating this mental shift is gonna be really hard. You're not going to be thinking through things in a good, in a positive or regular way, right? And so when you feel calmer and once you have allowed some of that emotion to dissipate from your body, then you can create, you can remind yourself, okay, emotions are transient. They don't exist forever. This feeling is going to move through me and I'm not going to feel this way forever. And then you can think through it. You can ask yourself, okay, step one that I think is very important is to find the root of your emotion. You can ask yourself, what was, what's going on? right? What is the, this big reaction? What is underneath it? What is the underlying emotion? Because for feelings, especially feelings like anger, anger is not the, the emotion that you're just feeling. There's something underneath the surface that is triggering that anger. And when you can identify what that is. So for example, if you are, you know, you're in an argument with your spouse, are you feeling hurt? Are you feeling rejected? Are you feeling unappreciated? Are you feeling disrespected with your child tantruming? 
Are you feeling like an inadequate parent? Are you experiencing a sense of inadequacy? Are you in front of people so you're feeling embarrassed or humiliated? Those are the core emotions that then trigger the, the angry reaction. And once you know the underlying emotion, that core emotion, the next step is to figure out, okay, now that I know the emotion, what do I need? What's the underlying need? What would make me able to address this emotion and feel better? What do I need right now? It can be as simple as needing a hug, right? Needing a reminder that you are appreciated by the person sitting across from you. Needing a reminder that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciates you and what you do. Needing a reminder that you are worthy, you're not inadequate. Needing a reminder of the things you do as a parent for your child, right? all of these different things. And so that's the next step is finding a way to get the need addressed. Is there a way that you can fulfill this need, either yourself, right, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or reaching out to somebody to help you with this, right? So what do I need in order to have this, this, uh, in order to get this need addressed? All right. And then the last thing is, once you've kind of figured that out, working on changing your thought process. Negative thoughts are what keep us in the cycle of these big reactions. This is what keeps getting us into it and pushing us um, and pushing us to continue the negative pattern that results from, from these big reactions. So first you have to be aware of what you're saying to yourself and then being able to challenge your thoughts, being able to remind yourself just because I think this doesn't mean it's true. What's a more helpful thought that I can replace this with? How can this situation be viewed differently? Or how is, especially in moments of anger, how is Shaitan trying to get me to think about this situation? What's the story that he's planting in my head? And is that accurate? Is that an accurate situation? And then asking yourself another, another shift, if that one, if that one is uh, hard to do, is, is there something I can be grateful for? Because it's very hard to react in anger if you're also feeling grateful. And then finally, one of the ways that I find very helpful is realizing that any type of big emotion is uncomfortable and it's a kind of pain. And realize that every single pain is witnessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't go unseen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where the Prophet sallam reminds us that nothing afflicts a Muslim of hardship or illness or anxiety or sorrow, harm or distress, even the pricking of a thorn, but that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expiates his sins for it. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is witnessing the struggle that you're going through. He's witnessing the pain that you're going through. And that's a very calming thought as well. And so one of the greatest gifts that we can give to ourselves is working to change the reaction patterns that don't serve us, that don't help us, but rather harm us. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to bless you all with the ability to, to work on this and to move forward from it um, and to bless you all for all of your efforts and grant you ease, peace, and healing. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khairan. Ameen, ya Rabb. Jazakumullah khair. Uh, subhanallah, Sister Sarah. This, it's a very grounding session, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for this past, uh, you know, 20 minutes of talk. I know there's so much more I'm sure that, uh, you know, people want to ask and, and, and find out about, especially these practical mental health uh, kind of management skills. So I encourage you guys to definitely, definitely uh, check out Inside Out, where Stasar is covering, mashallah, 27 lessons. I don't know if you counted how long, uh, how much you were going for, mashallah, but 27 lessons. And it's it's a very broad range of topics when it comes to Muslim mental health that you're covering in the course. Um, so finally going all the way from like setting boundaries, these practical mental health skills, those lessons on those specifically, to grief, to trauma, to, uh, you know, self-harm and bullying and suicide. So mashallah, there's a, a very broad expanse um, of topics that you're covering. We're very excited to actually benefit from them inside the class and as I was mentioning to Sheikh Omar Hussein, uh, inshallah, get a chance to pepper you with questions during the live Q and A sessions. Jazakallah khair, Sister Sarah. Any last words before we uh, we close off, inshallah, for today's topic? Well, yeah, go no, Jazakallah khair. And um, it's it's a topic that I've been passionate about for so many years, and it's just so wonderful to see how many you know, like the Al Maghrib, you know, is doing this course, and that they're you know these wonderful speakers um, and these wonderful modules, and really. For all of you who sign up, and inshallah, I really hope you do, you really get what you put into it. And it's something that can really be transformative if you choose to implement the different things that are spoken about, you know, by Sheikh Omar Hussain, by Sheikh Omar Sulaiman, and myself in the in the course, inshallah. So it's something that can really bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well, inshallah. Yes.
Very well said. Inshallah, we'll see you inside the course. Uh, for now, Jazakallah Khair for this evening, and we'll see you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Awesome sauce. I hope that you guys really benefited from that. Mashallah, I saw a lot more people join us and uh, start dropping their gems and drop their, oh, sorry about that. Drop their personal experiences, mashallah, into the chat there. So Jazakallah Khair for sharing as we're uh, jumping into the final session, inshallah, for tonight's webinar on the map to come. We will be having Sheikh Omar Suleiman with us in just one second. But a quick reminder that the course Inside Out is actually closing tomorrow. So the window of opportunity to register is closing soon. And again, we've made this pay what you can. And so it's accessible to everyone worldwide. If you yourself have already registered, mashallah, thousands of you have, make sure that you share it with your loved ones so that they can get their own access us. They can get lifetime access to all of the course content uh, by all three of our instructors, like lifetime access to the five Q&A sessions and the modules as well so that they can go at it their own pace. Um, inshallah, the last session that we have for today's uh, webinar in partnership with the Akeen Institute is, of course, with the founder of the Akeen Institute, Sheikh Amr Salima. And there's very few of you who are not familiar with him, but just to quickly introduce him before he jumps on to tackle his topic of settling a turbulent heart overcoming worry. Sheikh Omar Salman is the president of Yakin Institute. As I just said, he's a longtime instructor at a Maghrib Institute. He's the founder of the Muslims Understanding and Helping Special Education Needs. And basically, he just doesn't sleep, mashallah. So he's been very busy uh, behind the scenes with all, all these efforts within the Muslim community. And now, alhamdulillah, he's contributed to this course, a module on Tazkiyah. Uh, so assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Sheikh Omar. How are you doing today? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, I'm well. How are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm super excited for this topic and I'm very glad that Alhamdulillah we had uh, the partnership with Yakin Institute almost intentionally, unintentionally initially with this course with two Yakin yeah. contributors and then uh, yourself, mashallah, for this course. And as well that we've added this kind of spiritual element because I know usually the community get it, gets it backwards. They assume that with mental health, you start with just spirituality and you stop there. So Alhamdulillah, we, we tackled the kind of professional approach with our licensed professional counselors on how to tap, tackle issues of mental health uh, and now, alhamdulillah, we ended it off with your module on tazkiyah and how to tackle the spiritual aspect of it. So I'm going to pass it off to you, inshallah, for today's session. And we're excited again, of course, for your Q&A session in the course as well and to your contribution. Bismillah, let's kick off. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu wa sallam wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So first of all, it's always good to see uh, Muslim organizations come together and work together uh, for the greater good, especially to address issues of such great importance. So uh, while it may have been unintentional on our end in the beginning that uh, all of the instructors are also a part of Yaqeen Institute, Alhamdulillah Rabbil uh, Ameen, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala's design is perfect. And I think that hopefully it sets the right tone that uh, we're all in this together. You know, we are one body. And as we're one body as an ummah, we're one body across institutions, we're one body across individuals. We, uh, we care for our weakest we care for our most vulnerable we care for our uh for our for our brothers and sisters wherever they are in whatever situation they are in so alhamdulillah i mean i i really uh i'm, I'm happy to see this effort uh of our institutions working together on such an important course and also uh you know grateful that al maghrib alhamdulillah is making it open so sign up inshallah ta'ala and uh, make sure that you benefit from this course. I can say with, with a lot of confidence, and uh, this is not like some you know false humility here, uh, my modules are the least beneficial <laughs> of this course. And I say that because I actually had a chance to go through some of the modules, alhamdulillah, from Sister Sara and uh, Sheikh Omar Hussein. Um, you know, I might be like on par with Sheikh Omar Hussein's uh, modules, but Sister Sara is just completely... Uh, blow mine out the water, alhamdulillah, I mean, they're absolutely beneficial. And so I want everyone to please go and, and avail yourself of this information. Now, with that being said, I spoke about the Teskia elements, and I think as was emphasized in both talks uh, prior to this one, you know, Sheikh Omar Hussein talked about suicide, and he went through the Islamic rulings of suicide, and the fact that religion is a part of suicide prevention. And Sister Sara spoke about the merging of spirituality with ways in which we can control our behavior for a greater good and ultimately benefit in both our dunya and our akhira. So my portion here is to build on that, that you know what, spirituality is a part of the solution because to us as Muslims, spirituality is a part of every solution. And when we look at this idea of happiness and sadness holistically, you cannot divorce the idea of happiness and sadness from good deeds and sins. 
And so I, I talk about this hadith, where the Prophet said that if your good deeds make you happy and your bad deeds make you sad, then you are a believer. That's not to say that it is only good deeds that make you happy and it is only sins that make you sad. But certainly that good deeds are the greatest form of contribution to happiness because they give you purpose and they give you paradise and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sins offer the greatest form of deprivation because sins give you sadness and regret and then ultimately remorse in the hereafter if they are not repented from. Now, I want to address a different element of this, inshallah ta'ala, for the purpose of the webinar. You know, I was, I was thinking about a couple of things, um, you know, before this webinar. One of them was this narration, and it's it's not strong as a hadith, um, though it's it's quoted in a lot of books of Tazkiyah as a hadith. Uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu is narrated to have said that the love of this world is the root cause of every uh, of every sin. To, to say that the and what that means is that the excessive love of this world, love of this world, particularly that it leads to unhealthy attachment and leads to disobedience, is the root cause of every form of disobedience, is the root cause of every sin. Uh, it's strong as a statement from Hassan al Basri, rahimahullah ta'ala, and it's certainly a, a uh, you know, a meaning or the meaning of that is authentic and can be found throughout the hadith of the Prophet. And when we think about this, you know, this idea here that the love of this world is the root cause of every sin, you know, you, you look through the transgressions and you look through the destructive flaws. And I'll get to why that's connected to this subject. And you find that people get uh, attached to dunya and then they are willing to do what they whatever they have to do in order to gain that dunya. And so their unhealthy attachment to the dunya leads them to cheat, leads them to lie. Uh, leads them to harm. Sometimes our egos lead us to aggression. Um, it, you know, you look at the power struggles um, throughout the Muslim world and throughout history, you know, in fact, and subhanAllah, what that has done, the love of the crown, right? The love of the throne and what that has done to completely destroy and demolish societies and civilizations. And so hubba dunya, it's at the root cause of that. So where is this on, on a very personal level? Uh, you know, that, that we can benefit from if the root cause of every sin is too much love of this world and every sin bears sadness, then there is a connection between the excess of sin and the excess of attachment to this world. Now, the flip side of that is that hubb al-akhirah, to love the hereafter, and this is not a narration, at least not that I know of, uh, attributed to even any of the salaf, but uh, just the the op the opposite of what's being said here authentically by Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala, the love of the hereafter is the source of all goodness, is the source of all good deeds. And of course, this is consistent throughout the Qur'an that you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you pursue the hereafter in the spirit, in the vein of that love that you have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the reward that you seek from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, in the hereafter. And so, at-ta'alluq billah wa ta'alluq bil-akhirah to, to be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to, uh, to be connected to him at a, at, a, at a deeply personal level so that you, you see past every other temptation in this world because your heart cannot be tempted away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of its attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To connect yourself to the akhirah is to connect yourself to a pursuit and to give yourself a place of depositing your good deeds and a place of hope and a very tangible uh, future, something that you have certainty in that is coming to look forward to and to invest in. Now, as I was thinking about one of the profound connections between a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and a dua of the Prophet ﷺ and actually what's been said by Sister Sara uh, prior to me, um, there's this dua that the Prophet ﷺ taught the companions frequently. Allahum inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan wa'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal-kasal wa'udhu bika min al-jubni wal-bukhl wa'udhu bika min gharabat al-dayni wa qahr al-rijal Now, I've given a lot of khutbahs about this hadith and I'm going to approach it from an angle that I have not approached in any prior khutbah in a moment because it's one of those ahadith, it's one of those duas that you can you know, reflect on for days and days and days and days, and it's profound in its sequence and the words that are chosen. Uh, there's just so much to benefit from it. So 
اللهم إني أعوذ بك من الهم والحزن. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from hum and hazan, anxiety and uh, sadness, grief. Now hum refers to uh, anxiety, particularly in the Arabic language, that's caused by, you know, what, what's to come, okay? The fear of what's to come. Hazan, uh, the grief, is caused specifically by, you know, a person lamenting on the past, all right? So grieving over the past. And that's why when the angels come to us, when we pass away, if we are amongst the righteous, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst them and say, Allah tahafu wa la tahzanu wa abishiru bil jannati lati kuntum tu adun. That do not be afraid and do not be sad and you know carry the glad tidings of that which you have been promised, which is paradise. So Allah tahafu means don't fear what is to come. Wa la tahzanu, don't grieve over what you are leaving behind. So it's past and future. Okay. Future anxiety, past grief. And here the dua is, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan. Now those two things, O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from uh, anxiety and from grief. Those two things ultimately paralyze a person, right? I can't move. And so the next part of the dua is, wa min al-ajzi wal-kasal, from being unable and from being lazy. Uh, so when a person cannot do anything anymore because they are pulled by these two, you know, these two poles, right, of, of hem and hazan, of anxiety and in grief. Now, subhanAllah, what I was just thinking about was so profound about our deen is that the deen teaches us to live in the present, to live in the present. And I, I reflect a lot on the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu um, I love the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so much, subhanAllah, because of how perfect they are in the collective example that they set for us, right? That they embody what it would look like for human effort uh, with what the Prophet Sallallahu the most perfect human being to come set, right? They just kind of embody that collective struggle to live up to the human effort, uh, the greatest of human potential. And as a generation, they achieve that. There is no generation greater than the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they embody as a collective, as a collective what the Prophet ﷺ gave to them, who is the most perfect human being, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what that means with the companions that you see each one of them had to struggle with something. Some of the Sahaba had a very dark past and one that could, could really harm them if they let the shaitan cause them to despair. Can you imagine if Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu allowed himself to be paralyzed by his past, he had a lot in his past, right? Imagine if Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu allowed for the shaitan to paralyze him with his past. Now, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu definitely remembered his past, but it motivated him. It motivated him to be the best version of himself in Islam. But can you imagine if Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, you know, I need a week because I just thought about, you know, this thing that I did before Islam, right? It would have been hard. Uh, it would have been a loss to him and it would have been a loss to the ummah as well. Okay? So, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu refused to be paralyzed. In fact, you think about many of the Sahaba who became Muslim after Uhud. Like, imagine, you know, being part of the Muslim community after you killed some of the greatest Sahaba and companions of the Prophet. What is it like to know that you killed some of the best of people and that you live? amongst the Prophet ﷺ after having caused him so much sadness and distress. But imagine if they 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 stopped there, right? But they didn't. And Allah and the Messenger ﷺ pushed them towards moving uh, forward and towards redemption. So that's the that's that's that side, right? Where like you refuse to be paralyzed by the past, the despair, the grief, the sadness that comes from the past. And in the future, these people feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they feared the consequences of sin more than anyone else. They were worried that Dajjal would rise in their midst, that the day of judgment would come while they were still alive. But subhanAllah, these were the people that embodied what the Prophet ﷺ said, that if the day of judgment is established and you have in your hands something to plant, then plant. Uh, make sure that you go ahead and you plant that, that, that last tree, that last seed. Go ahead and do so. That's called living in the present, right? That's called living in the present. That at any moment, whether you are 
you know, on the heels of a sin or a good deed that could make you complacent or a sin that could cause you despair or a trial that, you know, bears sadness or, you know, a, a, a glad tiding or something good that happened to you that bears celebration. But there's always something for you to say and something for you to do in the moment, in the moment. And so people that debate about the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, they're debating something that is completely out of their hands, right? You want to challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the design, on how you got here and where you're going, or how someone else got there, or how someone else is, where someone else is going. Uh, you know, knock yourself out. You're not going to get anywhere. Okay? You're not going to get anywhere. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has things that he has concealed from your knowledge. And you're just going to, you're going to uh, engage in an exercise, a fruitless exercise. If you just stay in that, right? It could have been this way. It should have been this way. It should be this. It should be that. No, like living in the moment. I'm going to do what I should be doing, what I can be doing. And I will leave both the past and the future to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The past and that I sincerely repent. And when it, you know, when it comes to sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I, I trust in his forgiveness, the future. I trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's design. I trust in his promise, so I'll continue to work towards the future. But the point is, is that I'm going to live in the present. And so, subhanAllah, one deep connection in that hadith, in that dua, and then I'll, I'll stop there, inshallah ta'ala, um, is this idea of what hem and hazan do to actually provoke ajz and kasal. Uh, when a person is stuck in the past or worried about the future to where they cannot do anything in the moment, in the present. And the way the Prophet ﷺ taught his companions and his ummah by extension to live in the present. So I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to do that which is pleasing uh, to him. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala activates us to all good and forgives us for our sins, keeps us away from evil and forgives us from uh, forgives us for our sins. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the best of this life and the next and protect us from the punishment of the hereafter. Allahumma ameen. Uh, by the way, as you sign up for the class, inshallah ta'ala, I hope everyone uh, is going to sign up, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, there is going to be a special announcement tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala, on uh, Yaqeen's page, inshallah ta'ala, as well, of a new series that is coming out. So I just thought I'd plug that in there. So watch out uh, if you're uh, on, on my Facebook page or if you're on Yaqeen's uh, page, inshallah ta'ala, watch out for an announcement tomorrow morning, inshallah ta'ala, as well. And please do sign up. And Jazakum Al Khayyan, Sister Hafsa, and uh, Maghrib team for, for putting this together. Actually, that's a great reminder. We have the whole Yakin and Amagir families here. So, Amagir peeps, go follow the Yakin page, uh, subscribe to their YouTubes and their Facebook. Yakin peeps, go follow the Amagir uh, YouTubes uh, or subscribe to the YouTubes and, and, and put your notifications on for their Facebook, inshallah. Um, there's so much beneficial content coming out from both organizations. Yakin for the, you know, for, for building up you know, the, our, the strength and our deen and our faith. And Amagir, so much Islamic education coming out. Alhamdulillah, this has been an amazing collaboration. We're so excited for the fruits of it. And you haven't even started benefiting yet. This is just the webinars. This is just some of the gems beforehand. The class itself is an immensely beneficial experience. Sheikh Omar, jazakallah khair for being part of this um, and for being such a champion of it and 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 for, for incorporating, you know, the other mod your module in the class as well. We're very excited to see it, inshallah. Just a few reminders for everyone before you go, but Sheikh, I'll let you go, inshallah, for now. Uh, we'll see you inside the course. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Awesome sauce. I hope that you guys really benefited from today's webinar, the map to calm in partnership with Yakin Institute and Amagrib Institute. Before you go, as the Sheikh said, the doors are closing very, very soon for Inside Out. That is the, the fruits of all the labor that we put in for well over a year now, alhamdulillah, uh, filming these intensely beneficial modules broken down into to, to, to easy to consume lessons uh, on the topics surrounding Muslim mental health. The in-depth, the taboo, the difficult, the tough, uh, the inspirational, the motivating, the everyday. Um, I highly encourage you guys to head over to amalgrib.online. If you have any questions, there's a chat box there where you can submit any questions. If you want to submit, send an email, you can do that to info at amalgrib.org. And we're just super excited for you guys to benefit from the hard work of our mental health professionals, our instructors, Sheikh Amr Hussain and Sheikh Amr Sadiman and Sister Sara Sultan, they've done an amazing job with this course and you're going to find this the best things that you uh, invested in for yourself, alhamdulillah. And we've, of course, as I mentioned before, this is pay what you can. So it's everyone across the globe. Please make sure you register, you share with your friends, your families, your communities, because Muslim mental health has been 
uh, you know, something that has been underrepresented, undereducated about for so long. And this course has been doing a great job, mashallah, of breaking down barriers and change and, and tackling those stigmas. So Jazakallah Khair for being part of this amazing journey with us. We have one more webinar headed, uh, coming out, inshallah, tomorrow as well, which we're very excited to close off the class with. But keep in mind, once again, the class itself is not going to be available for very long. So head over right now to online so that we can see you on the other side. You can ask your questions to our instructors and you can benefit it much more deeply, inshallah, on this topic. Uh, Institutes for partnering with us for this webinar. Inshallah, was, we'll be looking forward to so many more experiences with you guys in the future. For now, take care, stay happy, stay healthy, everyone, and we'll see you inside the course, Inside Out. Assalamu alaikum.